Um, so by way of a quick intro, so um, for Advances, uh, we are a VC fund investing in early stage companies. Um, historically, we were pre-seed, so we had a bit of an incubator model. So we had an investment arm, but we also had a studio team, which basically had um, tech specialists, brand specialists, people, people like me, um, helping people build. We've now moved to later stage. Um, and so I am the head of people over there. So basically do two roles. One is, um, I use the word look after, but they're not children. Um, our internal team, which is basically an investment team and studio team uh, from anything from people related. So employment, law, hiring, firing, keeping them happy, engagement, L&D. Um, but in the main supporting our portfolio company, so our founders do anything. So we've got 65 companies, um, some of them much greater, much larger, some of them smaller, and they've all got different people challenges and priorities. So basically working them on whatever those may be, but a big specialist within the people ops in the employment law space. Awesome. I guess it would be good to understand when you're talking about the challenges that your portfolio companies face from an earlier stage perspective. So what are some of the initial challenges that founders face when they're first looking to kind of hire key members of their team? Actually, it's almost like a step, a step behind that. So actually going in for that investment, you've got, um, when I was at Kindred, for example, which is another VC fund, you actually have a bit of something called like a founder valuation. So you all know this, but the VCs are basically teeing all of you up individually. And can you do the role that you're projecting yourself to do? Are you taking the role of a CEO or are you taking the role of a CTO? Or are you taking a brand specialist role within the business? It's working out like what your role is first of all, and then looking at what you need to hire around that to hit your first year goals. And um, for most of us in VC world, and I've been victim to this myself um, as a failed founder, I won't go into that in too much detail. Um, quite often VCs can say, oh, well, if you're going to take 500K and you're a tech company, you now do have a team of 10 engineers based on very little data and what you're trying to achieve, just based on some books that have been written in the past. So I think if you need to redefine what skills you need or what you want to hire, it's worth, first of all, reflecting on what, who are you, what do you need to achieve, um, and what skills have you got, and be open to yourself around what you can't do and hire against that in your first few tranches. Sorry, I keep muting myself and unmuting myself, which is why there's a little second delay. Um, so is there ever a situation then when the, the, you think the founder might not be the right person to be the CEO of a business or is it okay if a founder comes along and doesn't want to be the CEO? Um, both and actually sometimes it's better if the founder comes along and doesn't want to see you do to be the CEO by recognizing they can't do that role that's not what they want to be doing either so quite often we see um, founder slash CEO or founder slash CTO that's really common um, but we also see those roles evolving so we've worked with quite a few portfolio companies in the main with Kindred actually where the founder starts as a CEO just in terms of raising money doing the investor relations and those core elements of that role um, but as they've grown they then hire investor relations people or they might hire finance people CFOs that might take on that remit and then they realize that their role is more visionary or maybe more external piece facing it's so just working that out um, that said if you came in from an investment pitch and you didn't have a CEO I think would be a bit like well who's going to be running the business if you're building the tech over here who's actually doing the business ops piece so it's worth having thought that through and where I've seen great results there is people having awesome advisors on their books who basically help steer those reins in those initial conversations yeah because I think people just automatically give themselves the title of a CEO because that's the one role that they think they have to have filled even if that's not necessarily their background or experience or what they want to do going forward. What about, um, so a question that we get all the time um, is about the, the tech, technical co-founder slash having a CTO versus outsourcing tech using an agency, having a no code platform or that kind of thing. And there's this expectation that if you don't have tech in house, that that will impact you negatively when you come to fundraise. Is, is that the case when you're pitching to investors? How critical is it to have that tech person as part of the core team? Um, the way I tend to evaluate it is if you don't have a tech person in your core team, who's evaluating the code that you're getting from the outsourced provider? So there needs to be some sort of review process in place. That could be a business operations person, which is what we've seen at Forward quite a few times. Um, in which case, if they know what they're looking for, they're able to evaluate it fairly and they can almost run the sprints themselves from afar that works fine and um, obviously from a vc perspective we've got two hats on one is can this evolve and grow and therefore do we need the tech person internally but also there's a run rate risk right in terms of cash and outsourcing is predominantly a lot cheaper the other risk is by hiring a cto you've got someone that's a leader but maybe doesn't want to do the do so it's just working out all of that piece and um, what I would always recommend is if you were doing the outsourcing, someone needs to know how to measure it and how to monitor it. Um, and also the, this is really boring from my like legal side of my brain, but those contracts need to be super tight because the amount of times we've had to muscle in to try and help negotiate things that have gone wrong where delivery hasn't been met um, is massive. And it costs companies lots of money. It's like we've seen half a million spent or wasted on product that could have been done potentially in-house by a couple of engineers. Interesting. 
And so like, is there, I don't know whether you help with this, but if someone was trying to figure out what questions to ask, if you're non-technical and you're interviewing for a technical lead, tech lead, CTO, whatever it might be, but someone that's going to do the doing, uh, but you're not technical yourself, how do you know what questions to ask them or how to evaluate whether what they're saying is true? So I'd always bring in a partner. So for example, at Ford, we've used our CTO to do the technical interviews for our founders. And there's plenty of people through an advisory network called the CTO network who would do that. Um, They normally want a little bit of something, so you wouldn't do it for free necessarily, but sort of a day rate allowance or something like that. Um, The other thing I would always ask yourself is, is our tech really unique? So for example, um, is it taught really, really amazingly over in Poland and therefore you want to hire from Poland and actually what you're trying to solve is your remote working policy or how you set up your different entities? Or is it that that skill set's really available anywhere and then you can make the choice yourself around if you hire internally or hire remotely in the UK or outside of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing to flag is I think um, there's two different types of CTO and you've got to work out in your leadership team what you're looking for. So are you looking for a pure tech developer, so building your product, or do you need someone that's going to then lead and manage the team moving forward? I think the profiles are very different. So you're looking for either a people leader or a pure individual contributor and it's working that piece out first too. And that will yeah. help to find whether it's an outsourced team or if you need an individual. I've heard this a lot about people that think that they have to hire a CTO because everyone thinks that you come in and you're the CEO and then you get a CTO and you kind of fill all these C-level positions. But actually someone who's a CTO, typically in their job, they're not actually building anything anymore. They're a, a pe- like a people leader and they don't even feel like they've got the skills to be able to develop the tech because they haven't done it for years by the time it gets to this point. So you have to think really carefully about what kind of person you've got you and you can you can get consultant CTOs and and this kind of thing can't you so I don't know if you've got any opinion on having someone coming in and consulting for a day or two with various different startups to save money but get that expertise I think that model works really really well and actually um you'll find in particular from a CTO perspective and also COO perspective what we've seen at Ford is lots of individuals doing that piece now want to do it for equity rather than cash so depending on where you are in your cycle and your run rate you could actually probably negotiate an equity deal there or something like that, where therefore you're not spending a grand a day on a really expensive consultant that you're not getting code delivered for. Yeah. Would you say that having that on your deck, um, if you've got a consultant CTO, you could put them in your team on your deck? Or do you think that's a bit like cheating? Definitely put them on your deck. So um, what I would do it forward, and maybe this isn't relevant to all VCs, um, but we're really people first. So we want to know who your team are and actually what do they do for you? Um, don't lie don't say they work for you full-time if they're doing a day a month obviously because that'll come out in the due diligence but if you have that really impressive advisory group even if it is just people in your network you lean on get them on your page get permission but get them on your team page I think it's really important um, and we definitely feel the importance of those roles yeah do you agree with, with when it comes to advisory board as well because we've had mixed opinions on whether you have the advisory board within your deck or whether it's just not important at all so I think uh if I was being really honest with you, we've probably invested with more companies who've had the advisory board deck because um, we've used them as referencing points, but also we've realized that they've got a really good network around them. So actually when it's really, it could be really hard in those first couple of years, particularly the first six months, you've got a great network around you that looks really strong. Um, but again, that will get dug into during the pitches and the investment rounds. So there needs to be people that you can really refer to and understand what their role is and how they're supporting. Um, where I've seen that really, really important, I don't know if anyone's doing this in the businesses here, is that fintech space. And going for sort of your FCA regulations and all that process, that's complex. Having someone that's gone through that before and can advise is really positive. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is, I know this is going to be different depending on um, the skills of the individual founder and what businesses they're building. But what do you think are the first few critical roles that people should hire for once they've closed like, pre-seed investment or an angel round? So they've got maybe 150, 300K. So a really good question. And like I said, it's probably based on what they're trying to build. So if they're a product business, then it's probably a product tech person doing the building of the product. Um, if it's a, they need to build up the sales marketing side, then they probably need to get that sales piece in there. But actually um, what I think a lot of people don't do, and I'm not saying this is a permanent employee, but could be a consultant, is this product market fit brand positioning piece. And um, too often that comes too late, I think. And therefore you've missed the market on where you fit. And actually then you're like, shit, we've got a product here, but we don't know who wants it. And actually we've built it the wrong way around. Yeah. Interesting. And the other role I think about is if you get, um, if you if your cash you've got in is to build a team, and that's the whole ethos around why you raise the fund or raise the money, um, is debating this 
internal TA person, whether it's a fixed term contract or a shorter or a company that comes in and does it, it's quite a few other like talentful um, or uh, outsourcing to agencies are expensive. Also, recruitment is a really long winded process and takes a long period of time. So sometimes bringing in a really good TA for an FTC period could be really positive. Yeah, that's a good idea, because I kind of I had two questions based on what you just said. The first one is um, there is this pressure that all investors, uh, all founders say that they feel as soon as they get cash in the bank, they feel like they have to spend it immediately. And it comes with this whole new amount of work. So you've been working so hard to get the fundraise over the line, six, nine, 12 months of pitching investors. Finally, you get the cash in the bank. You're like, oh, now I can relax, but you can't because you have to spend it all. And normally you're spending it on people. So then you have to go through the whole process of, yeah getting job ads out there, recruiting, interviewing, that kind of thing. Is that true? Like from an investor's perspective, would, would it, if you, you met up with a founder three months after you'd given them money and they hadn't spent it yet that quickly, is that like a, a bit of a red flag or is this a founder's expectation that isn't actually aligned? I don't think it's a red flag. In fact, we found it the opposite way at forward. So when we do our touch bases, if they spent nothing, massive red flag, of course. But if they've spent enough, but then it's not... We almost see it the other way around where they go too fast, too thick. And actually it then becomes a, um, a situation where they need to cut the fat, if you like, in terms of they hire too quickly. They don't really know what people are doing. And by the time they've learned it, they've already hired somebody else. So actually sometimes it's better to go slow, not too slow, but slower to actually really have the growth that you need, but with the right people. Yeah, because that's what that was the other part of the question, which is that we've seen these big scaling tech companies that go on a massive recruitment drive end up hiring so many people. There's a culture issue with this as well, because scaling the team that quickly and having the right culture seems to be really yeah. difficult. But then then they kind of have to scale back again or it's really difficult because it's such rapid hiring to find the people that are good versus the people that are not not performing and then you've got to go and yeah trim the fat kind of thing as you say which then ends up getting or makes it look like your business isn't doing as well as it might have been and so there's all the, the kind of side effects of that as well definitely interesting um so let's say you've got the money you are going to scale the team and you're writing a job description just for a bit of um extra clarity we had a session this morning with a guy called Frank Starling who is a DE&I expert so he was talking about how to make sure that you're writing job adverts or creating a culture which has you know which is inclusive and equitable and that kind of thing but from your perspective how do you write a job description that stands out against not only like the Googles and Facebooks and big tech companies of the world who can pay huge salaries and benefits, but also against like the unicorn startups that everybody is really excited to work for or the startups that have loads of impact that, you know, people know about because they've heard of them because they're consumer. What, what tips do you have? So, um, the best advice I can give on this is to make sure you're, what you're trying to, the mission of the business is really available and what people can see while this is exciting. Um, thing wrong, if, you, if it's not ESG related, doesn't mean it's not an exciting business. People are fascinated by lots of different things. So your mission and your purpose needs to be at the top. Um, I agree with um, Frank and the not putting, uh, to be really clear, like saying you've got learning potential or you can lead a team potentially next five years, all these things that every other startup says, they're actually just really redundant and they just don't appeal, I don't think. I think what you're better off saying is our growth plan for the next 12 months looks like this and this is what we want to achieve. People care more about what you're trying to do and how you're going to do it rather than like a you get 28 or unlimited holidays which I mean I've got an opinion on that too but rather than trying to fluff it with all the different benefits just make it really about the job this is what the business is trying to do this is what the job we want to do in the next 12 months this is how we think you can help us and then if you've got a great advisory and board team or group team share those people too so they get excited by them um, and then what I think you do once you've got just the basics of what it, the actual role is is go to the right networks to pitch it so don't just do a generic LinkedIn post whereby your own network see it. Just go and hunt out the different networks you want to get involved in um, and rummage your way through there. Is there any specific networks that you recommend from uh, getting it out to more under underrepresented people? 
Um, yeah, so I think there's a few there's, um, things like colour in tech, which have become really big recently, actually places like that, depending on what you're trying to hire for. There's also lots of unique groups on LinkedIn. So if you go into the LinkedIn search bar, if, for example, um, you want to look at underrepresented groups, you can just type that into a search bar and it brings you up lots of different areas. You can choose females or what it might be um, black minorities, anything like that will crop up. And that's always a really good avenue to go through first, I think. Um, and then within those groups, you normally have to pitch to try and get into them to be able to tap them up. Um, and if I'm being quite transparent, I think sometimes that can be a hindrance if you are, for example, a white man, um, because it might not be that they want you in the group initially. So it's just working out how you navigate through there. Yeah. Um, and again, that's where sometimes using your network comes in to help. How, how much do you find salary is important versus offering equity for those early employees? I think it really depends on the makeup of what you're recruiting for. So I think, um, for example, if you're recruiting lots of, if you need lots of doers and not necessarily lots of experience, you might end up, hypothetically speaking, um, hiring more junior employees, so potentially fresh out of university or people that have been doing apprenticeships. And therefore, for that database, that group of people, just based on research, the, the salary piece would be more important. Um, whereas I think when you're tending to have someone that's done the role before or someone with more experience, the equity piece becomes a good negotiator. How I think it's a really nice way to tackle it, depending on what your cap table looks like, is actually making an offering of two different options. So a company called Fair will do this, and I love it. Um, it's from my Kindred portfolio. But what they will offer you is a base salary and an equity package. And you can either have, um, and they give you two options. So one is like a higher base, lower equity, or one is a lower base, higher equity. And you as an individual get to then choose. So that way it makes it a little bit more inclusive. So it depends on each person's circumstance. So if at the moment you're in a position whereby you need the cash, uh, you can choose that element. And actually, if somebody needs, yes, you've got the main, main bit of cash you need, but you would rather have equity, you get that choice. Yeah. Do you recommend anywhere where you can benchmark the salaries slash equity that you're offering against other startups slash scale ups? Yeah, so uh, there's always um, there's lots of different benchmark tools you can pay for. Um, don't ask for VC, they've probably got access to them anyway, um, which is around the pre-seed and C. So, for example, there's one called VC Impact, which has really good lots of data in there. Um, also, though, if you've got time and energy, and I appreciate given what you're all doing at the moment, that might not be uh, there like in lots, but um, companies like Otter, where it's a job board, but ultimately they're all really public in terms of the salaries that they're sharing. You can do a quick search on there and it's really, really informative. I've definitely found that I've found that tool more useful sometimes than the big benchmarks that have got 2000 lines worth of data for you to go through. Yeah, and is that, I don't know Otter that well, is that just UK based or is it for roles outside of the UK as well? UK and remote based. So um, it's got the no base, if, like no base, I guess. Um, and then for the US, there's lots of US VC funds that release data publicly as well. Again, Impact have got a VC US data piece too. The only thing I would caveat that with is lots, lots of it's more like Series B, Series C data. The smaller companies don't have as much data on there. Yeah, okay. And I, I think from what I know about the US market, the, the piece around getting equity, there's way more emphasis put on that because they've seen so many more successful exits that they understand the opportunity that having equity provides. Whereas in our ecosystem, which is slightly younger, people haven't seen enough success stories off the back of owning equity that they, they really see how valuable it is. You're exactly right, exactly right. And you'll see that in the profiles that you're negotiating with come off the stage. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, anyone that has any questions just a reminder to pop them into the chat and you can also raise your hand and ask Nat directly um I just want to quickly go into a little bit about the D E and I piece as well when it comes to either writing a job description or evaluating potential team members do you have any tips about how to write a job description or interview um, in a way that allows you to make sure that you're making a fair decision about who who gets hired so i think from the job description it's writing what you need the person to be able to do so what you're saying there is that you don't necessarily have to have all of this years of experience i don't need you to have been ahead of in the past this is the skill set that i need you to be able to do so you're removing the um unfortunately like already privileged backgrounds have created this hierarchy with which you see obviously around gender bias, et cetera. So it's around what you actually need the person to be doing. And then they can talk who different experiences. The second thing is to have your salary banding public. And that way it doesn't become a, um, when it comes to the gender equality and pay piece, you don't end up having a debate where people have to sell themselves in. You're just saying, this is what I think this role is worth. 
um, and it's just much more transparent, I think, from a job description piece. And from an interview piece, there's a few things I would definitely suggest doing, and it's almost like outlining it at the beginning of your cycle. So one is um, putting some metrics in place. So that's almost threefold. So one is, um, first of all, your hiring metrics. That should be your diversity in your hiring panel. So who's, who's doing the interviews? And is that a diverse metric there? So have you got a fair representation? You might not be able to, and therefore you have to utilize your advisors, et cetera. Um, the second thing would be looking at your applicant pool and diversity within that. And um, if it's biased, then you need to think about where you're reaching those people from. Um, and then it will be your internal team and diversity there. And if you're seeing that you've got diversity in your hiring panel and your hiring pool, but not internally in the team, something's broken there. So it's just to help you identify where the problems are. And the same with internally. Um, I think there's lots of things around policies, procedures you need to have in place that are inclusive or makes the environment a good place to be. Uh, otherwise, why would anybody want to come and work there? So you need to make sure you've got the basics in order first. Yeah, um, and, that and this, kind of came, by this came up earlier a bit in Frank's session as well. So there's no point hiring a bunch of diverse people, but then when they start working, the culture isn't right and they don't feel like they've got the psychological safety they need to be the, their full selves at work. And then you, you lose all the value of getting those people into the business. Um, so if anyone didn't watch that session, you can watch it back on YouTube. We can send you the link afterwards rather than going over it again for anybody that was in the session. Um, I was going to ask another question, but I've just totally forgotten what it was. So whilst I think about it, Alexandra, do you want to take yourself off mute and ask yours? Yeah, um, firstly, thank you so much, Natalie. That's been really interesting and really helpful. I actually wanted to get your take on a question that I've had from two kind of two angels recently that threw me slightly. So we're a tech startup. Uh, we are tech. Um, and I have a background in product management, online product management. I ran a digital department for a FTSE 250 on the product side. Um, and my CTO, um, who is a founding, he's not a co-founder, but he is a kind of founding member of the team, has a sizable equity stake, is a super experienced engineer and architect who's worked for kind of Amazon, um, BBC Worldwide, Tesco, Talk Talk. So he's really like seasoned and experienced. He is currently kind of at the moment, he's about three days a week. And he is doing some of the, he's been doing the infrastructure setup for us, but similar to some of the conversation we're having, like the best use of him is not as a hands-on dev. Yeah. And we do have, we have a hands-on full junior full stack developer as well, who we've hired um, as a graduate out of a, an advanced computer science degree. And I've had some questions about him not being full-time and whether with our fundraise, he will go full-time. And it, that's been a really interesting thing for me because he, He's got like another kind of, he's got a passion project he's trying to pursue. He also does a little bit of freelancing, predominantly also because of his salary requirements. So when he works full-time as a consultant, he's on a very large sum, <laughs> you know, a much larger sum than we're able to provide. And also even with a pre-seed round of 150 would want to spend right now. It's never bothered me because he attends daily stand-ups like he's available he provides mentoring coaching he does all the technical architecture etc but I've had a few people say that they are like oh that's you know why isn't he coming on full-time it's a tech company people aren't going to like that and I, I've it, I've never really thought about it I just was really interested based on what you said to sort of hear your take and any thoughts you might have about how I handle that handling that as an objection so there's two things. Um, so I think the way that I'll crop up in a due diligence piece that we might do, for example, at Ford would be, yes, to understand why he's part time. Um, but actually, it wouldn't be a negative. I think the fact that you're managing your cash is a really big positive, And the fact that you've got someone doing the buildings, also, you've ticked those boxes. I think where I probably want to push you a bit further is what's the contractual agreement here? So if he turned around tomorrow and said, I'm out, like, where does that leave you? What's your position? So actually, if it is that you've got a six month contract with a two month notice period in there, that it has to be, you know, those sorts of things, those are what I'd be looking at. So seeing what your protection looks like. And then after, so for your pre-seed round, I think that'd be fine. I think for your next round, there needs to be some sort of succession planning around that. So what's, yeah. your dream, what's the gap there? I think you need to talk to that a little bit. So I think the way you'd address it or respond to your angels, and also just to flag, and this is no, nothing in disrespectful around angels, that's a, we get that all the time. So angels are just looking at it from a, what they've seen in the past, what works and therefore will come through. And it's sometimes you have to just not try and fit the mold all the time. Yeah. Okay. Which is really, really common, unfortunately, but it's just the nature of the beast. So I think you that's, just want to argue the contract piece. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, 
yeah br the, brilliant thank you so much yeah really yeah. appreciate it awesome I just remembered what I was going to say it wasn't actually a question it was just like a little anecdote of what we heard so there's a company called figures which is similar to some of these other companies where they do benchmarking data about salaries and um, benefits and equity and a lot of founders were talking about the fact that when they interview a candidate that they like they ask them what they would want their salary to be and essentially they just give give people what they want as long as it falls within a band that they had pre-decided and men typically will ask for more than women so if you just give people what they've asked for there'll already be a bit of a, a gap in terms of what men are getting paid versus what women are getting paid and the other thing that they found was that men will often negotiate on that figure as well so even if you give them what they ask for it's likely that they'll try and negotiate higher anyway whereas if you give a woman what they asked for they're so happy that they got what they asked for that they wouldn't necessarily ask for any additional money and then that makes the gap even bigger and so what they were saying was you need to be really aware of that as the founder or the hiring manager because you might be doing what you think is fair and everybody's happy and they got what they asked for and then you see your your data and you've got a massive gap between what men and women are getting paid in the same roles now, I don't know if you've like had any experience with this, but that's, it just popped into my head when we were talking before. Um, one of our investments, um, Fair HQ, have done lots of research on this. And I think the last number that I read from their report was 38% more. So you don't just ask for a little bit more. Um, generically, it, like the, the amount of percentage a man technically would ask for is up to 38% more, which is massive. And um, the way I would manage that internally is to have a conversation really frankly, which I think is a really good thing to start from day dot with anybody or a future employee anyway, is a, now you know more about the role, does the salary balance that you understand, like make sure that expectation, the expectation is met every single time. Also by saying to somebody, um, having met you now in interview one, two and three, I feel like at the moment you're in my lower end of my banding based on these reasons, or I think you might be at the top end of my banding based on these reasons. So you're almost pre-closing somebody before you've even got to the point of an offer stage, but because you've been talking about it the whole way through, one, it feels really uncomfortable for the other person because they've already told you the whole way through that they're quite happy with their salary. Um, yes, there might be a situation where they've got another offer and you might have to change. I mean, these small examples, but ultimately it's just having this frankness along the way, but you leading that conversation by saying, here's where I feel like you fit. Yeah. Um, Sorry, you, you're down as iPhone too. So do you want to take yourself off mute and quickly um, introduce yourself and then ask a question? Yeah, sure. It's Lauren here. Um, I am in the kitchen, <laughs> hence why I've got a hair net. But, um, and I'm on my phone as well, usually on my laptop. But um, I had a couple of questions around like a first hire that we're looking to bring on. Um, so um, she, she may fill the role of like sales and operations manager. That's what I'm thinking. Um, it'll be our first hire with experience. Um, and my question is around um, what would like a reasonable share options um, kind of percentage look like? Because it's the first time that I've kind of gone through this and not sure what, yeah, what she might expect or what, what might be reasonable. Um, but she said that uh, share options would motivate her. So it's something that I'm looking to include. Um, and then also around the role name, um, as a first hire taking over some areas like sales and operations, um, would it be, I'm wondering if it makes more sense to go with a role title that allows her to grow and potentially develop into a COO in the future. But I'm also thinking it might not make sense to give someone that role who has some experience, but not, um, I guess, decades of experience in case we do hire like a COO in the future. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, just wondering how, what kind of role to start someone off at uh, it's better to give them a bigger role because you're early in your business journey or maybe something less senior that they have the potential to grow so i think um to answer your second question first i think less senior with the potential to grow i think what um you don't want to do which is it's happened to all of our portfolio companies i think without an exception is they've hired big roles because that's the only way to entice people than they thought um, which actually isn't necessarily true like people want the opportunity and actually they're excited by the business model etc um, and then they've had problems which is when we've got swooped in from an informal law perspective to work out how they hire above somebody without discrimination claims and things like that so I think you hire for the role that you need now but the way you talk about it to that employee potential employee is to say this is what I see the role evolving as but we're going to have really frank conversations the whole way through to say 
if we've got a load more money now, so we're actually gonna think about doing this differently or we've got less money and therefore it's gonna be like this. So I think sales and ops manager is a great place to start. Um, I think you need to really clearly define though how much of it is sales and how much of it is operations. And also think about if you're doing like a commission structure and how that looks with a bit of it operations, that would be the only thought I initially had. Um, I have seen lots of people using this title employee number one recently. So lots of our like pre seed companies are saying like number one employee. And initially I was a bit like, oh, it makes me a bit too cringy, even though I love a bit of cringe. Um, but actually it seems to be getting really well received. So once people see that you've been employee number one, you come across as like a grafter. You're able to do lots of, you can turn your hands to lots of different things. For example, sales, operations, some of them do financial work. And that's just a massive positive for where you are in your phase of growth. I think the challenge I would throw back to you though is when you get your next tranche of cash, then you have to think about how you define that role and making sure you retain that person if you need to retain them and keep them engaged. Um, and then to answer the second question, oh, sorry. Yeah, and I was gonna say that that's really great advice. Thanks so much. Um, and the, the bit around equity, um, this is a minefield, right? And I completely, I think it's worth talking about. So if you're doing it before you're going into a round, we don't know how much you're getting and therefore what equity you're giving away. Um, but we would tend to recommend depending on the level, anything from a 0.1%, up to we've seen people give away five percent in the past at forward um for those first employees and it's really difficult for us to manage that if i'm honest because i have a big chunk uh, of 10 valuation um so i think you need to keep it within the rounds of the role level that you're recruiting and then what their impact is really going to be on the business so for example if they're going to be building out your tech i'll probably give them a higher percentage um if they're doing more of your less impactful but something you need to get done it might be that you give them a lower percentage so it's working out what impact it's going to be first and therefore retaining that way and I think, for example, for you, if you're going for a funny round, it might be worth talking about options by giving them once you've raised the run. Sorry, I didn't get the last sentence. Giving them options might be when worth you talking about options, but then you you distribute them once you've raised a round, so then you know what they're equating to, and then you have some sort of numerical value. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do you know where I can find that like, information around commission structures for people who work in sales? Yes. Um, in fact, I will pop my email on here and I can find why well, I'll try and dig some out and share them with you because we recently did some it forward. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I actually have one follow up question that popped in if I had time um, to ask it. Um, because it's a first full time employee um, who might come on board. Um, I am just wondering if it would make sense because she's said that she'd be happy to work either part time or full time. Um, and we're just working out what would work best. Um, to see how we work together in person uh, we know yeah. each other like a little bit but I wonder if it would make sense to have some sort of like period where maybe we work together like one or two days a week um, if she has the availability to do that at our co-working space to see like how we work together before committing to bringing on someone on full-time and yeah maybe we don't even yeah I just it's difficult to envisage do we have um, enough for her to do and would it make sense for her to do that or she said that she might be able to, she might like to find say a freelance client to help her one day a week but I, I'm just thinking about how to discuss that with her um, that benefits us both to kind of get to know each other. Yeah, um, I first of all, I think it's amazing that you're thinking about it that way. So you're not just immediately burning through cash. So I think it's really positive. Um, I think the going for a part-time contract, first of all, with the ability to ramp up is the best way to do it. So you'll be using your normal employment contract just for less hours or a set amount of hours over the month or over a week and doing it that way. Um, I think also it's really inclusive. Therefore, you know, it's a good positive thing to do. Um, the only thing I would flag as a small caveat is if you want to try it full-time, you always have it feels a bit harsh you've got your probation period whereby if it doesn't work out you can let somebody go um if it's someone that you're close to already it might be more of a challenging conversation but ultimately you've still got that legal risk is removed and then with part-time you wouldn't be able to put in a probation period or you know you would yeah absolutely so you still do a probationary period it just might be a okay. nice easy way for you to ramp it up yeah okay yeah okay. thanks so much for the advice yeah i really appreciate it right catherine do you want to ask your question Yes, thank you. Very, very useful session, Natalie. Um, my question re um, actually relates back to um, the CTO issue. Um, so my, my company is a specialist in investment platform startup. Um, and I'm working after a competitive process. Um, I'm working towards an MVP with um, a developer who are great and have done already done quite a lot to develop the MVP on paper without being paid. But I don't have um, an in-house product owner. I don't, I mean, and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a developer myself. 
would it be credible to present one of the advisors as somebody to um, evaluate the performance of the developer or because they're not on a salary would they be there I mean at the moment they're not the advisors are not being paid would would that be credible as far as an investor was concerned or would they just think that was a bit too you might think it was a bit seat of the pants sort of arrangement I don't know <laughs> no I think it's really credible I think um anything where you're adding value in like that is definitely what the way I would definitely go because when we're doing yeah. our due diligence we'll ask you how you're um validating the work that's being done basically and actually if you've got that piece yeah. already sorted and you're not burning through cash massive positive oh hooray thank you yes. <laughs> Also, right. great that you managed to build it for free. Great start. Well, I haven't built it. No, 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 no. We've well, done. I mean, MVP. Paper. Yeah. <laughs> but they've done it. But they've done. They're, 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 you know, we did a joint. Um, we did a joint uh, Innovate UK grant application together. Um, and they didn't ask for any equity or anything for that. They just came in with me and obviously made it a lot stronger. So. Nice. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. I'm going Thank to you. just run through quickly a couple of questions in the chat. <clears throat> and then Yvonne, I'll then go to you afterwards. Um, Kofi, there's a question in here from you and Jody. If you want to ask directly, then raise your hand and we can do that directly and you can ask. If you don't raise your hand, then I'll ask on your behalf. But I'll ask MA's question first because she's had to jump off. Um, so how do investors view startups who've had to have a split from from a co-founder she's written in the past but it, I guess also relating to the business that they're pitching for if there's been a kind of co-founder split um, if it's done before the pitch I think it's a positive um don't I think it's something I would flag to you all now is the amount of times I've had to come into co-founder separations it, uh, like I couldn't even tell you how many I've had to do in the last 10 years it's really really common I think it's having those conversations early if you are going to have them and I don't think an investor would view them negatively what I would always do we do something called a founder evaluation so um a bit of what we call a top rating interview with a founder to understand really like what do you do and it'd be understanding why that relationship broke down is it personal circumstance is it based on cash is it based on or is it based on lack of a belief in the vision and the mission of the product and if that was the case that's where we'd want to dig in and be like actually then what where has it got disjointed if you both built this together why is it no longer one of their preferences so I don't think we view it negatively I think the fact that you've dealt with it's a positive um, and actually, to be really frank, I think if you find a people-led investor, um, you'll find that they'll challenge you anyway on the co-founder relationship. And we do something called a values match, which is basically like a, um, you don't want them to be identical as founders. We wouldn't want any of you to be co like completely identical as co-founders. You need to really like have a bit of everything, but it needs to be a at how you deal with any sort of um, conflict, when things go wrong, how that works. Um, and also to flag, um, and this is something that people get feedback to forward that maybe they're not like comfortable with, is understanding people's circumstances. I think if people are in different phases of their lives or have different drivers, actually it's understanding what those are. And we do ask about those to see if people are aligned. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to ask Jodie's question on her behalf. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the chat as well, but from a pre-seed perspective, you obviously can easily recruit people without capital to pay but you need doers to execute on products, marketing, et cetera, uh, which is why we'll be laying out the team plan attractively to early stage investors. Jody, I'm not sure exactly what the question is within that. Is it, does it make sense to lay it out to investors what your plan is with the team? You can, you can answer in the chat or you can take yourself off mute. Okay. Oh, yes. So, um, Got it. yes. I, so I think um, typically, uh, and probably correct me if you move into this, but um, as part of the funding that you're asking for, it would be interesting to see what the team looks like as a result of that. So I think laying it out is really positive. And it might be that you lay out like a phase one, phase two, phase three. So with the first tranche of cash, we want to create this team with a hope that we would achieve these objectives, OKRs, okay, how you operate. And then at that point, we might ask for this much. Hypothetically, that number will never be the same, I don't think, in a second pitch. But ultimately, we'll then raise, ask for this much money to deliver the rest of the team. And that's why we need these people. So I think it's a really big positive. I'll definitely put it in. I think the only thing I'd flag is, um, like, make sure you put like, realistic salaries and things like that in there. Because I think if, if investors see you hire a team of 10 with 25K, um, I think they probably want to know what you do with them. Do you, I mean, something else that we've heard is that investors don't love it if a lot a large percentage of the money is getting spent on marketing because I think the reason why is because it looks like you haven't 
proven that you've got product market fit or you don't know who your customers are yet. So you're spending all your money on like trying to get customers through the door and it seems more risky. Do you agree with that or do you have a different opinion? Um, we challenge hard on the marketing like allocation always. Um, and that's for two reasons. One is why, where are you spending it? Like if you're paying for Facebook and Google, Google ads, for example, is that the right place to spend it? Or is it that you just need to do some branding or you've done your market fit. So that will come in your consumer research piece if that's relevant to your product. So I think, yes, it's something you should think about where you're challenging it. Uh, but ultimately, I think if you've done all the work and you've got your product market fit and these are the attractions you're doing, then it's not a negative. But I think any big percentage in your whole budget would always get dug into. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Kofo's question, how do you handle issues with candidates that are very competent but have family issues? I've lost two ladies who are excellent, but the pressure of family life and running their businesses has led to them leaving. We're pre-revenue. Um, it looks like she's considering doing jobs, job share or something to tackle that, to make sure that you get great candidates in the door. Do you have any feedback? Um, I, first of all, it's a real shame that you've lost things. I think offering to do something like a job share is a really big positive. And actually it's a really flexible way of thinking, which a lot of companies still don't do, unfortunately. So I think that's positive. Um, I think the only way that you can, the only way, other way to think about this is maybe doing it based on an objectives or outcome based operation. So over, I don't know how quickly your business model works, but if you need to have something done over a month, you allocate, this is what I need to get done in a month and then give free reign to that person to get it done. Um, and that way you give you even more flexibility than what you've offered with the job share. It would depend on what business you've got and what you're doing. Um, but I think ultimately, it's just flexibility. It's having the flexible hours, being able to work around childcare if it's child's or if it's got anything like that. You know, it's really, really tough. I can talk through it from experience. Like working in three little monsters is really exhausting. So it's just giving people the flexibility around how they do that and how they operate best. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, question from Emily also in the chat. Female founders with a male co-founder or COO are 35% more likely to get VC funding. I guess as a female founder, um, is it worth making a tactical hire with these stats in mind so that you've got more opportunity to, to close the funding that you need? I mean, that's a really awful question you have to ask it, to be quite frank, like, but I completely get where you're coming from. Um, my personal opinion, so this is just where my hats are, I think you should uh, push through as a solo female founder. I think you'll see now, if you find the right VC, there are plenty of new VC funds out there that are doing the right thing from investing in diverse founders. So I think you just need to think about it. I get though that cash is a challenge and sometimes you just need to raise the cash and therefore you can become a bit desperate around where we get it from. And they don't mean desperate in a rude way. I mean, like, a, we want our business to succeed. We just need to get the money in. Um, but I think you need to be tactical because ultimately the VCs that are not giving cash to people because they haven't got a male uh, co-founder and not necessarily the VCs you want helping you through. They won't be advising you in the right way, moving your business forward. So I personally would, that, I mean, they're lost. Yeah, totally agree. Um, there's a there's a follow up question actually in terms of being a solo founder. Do investors perceive being a solo founder as a negative thing? No, but who is around you from a network perspective? That's it. Yeah, would be the big challenge. Yeah, I think we've heard quite and a few people. Think, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, one thing to flag is I think actually sometimes it's not. It's almost the opposite. When there's um, a number of co-founders, in particular, we've seen three is the like challenging number. It's it's almost too many people at the like, head of the realm. So I think it's just working. I think so is not a negative thing at all. Yeah, we've we've asked every investor that's come in during this program that question. And it, the positive thing is that the answer is always the risk is that there's so much pressure on you as the founder um, that the investors are just worried about your your capacity to continue. And so having that supportive network around you is so important to make sure that you can keep going, which is good. There's um, I think this this has already come up, but there's been some research that has been done about solo founders um, capacity to go and scale and become unicorns. And there was no difference between being a, a solo founder versus being part of a founding team in terms of your chances to go on and scale so the data speaks for itself which is good you just got to make sure you're supported definitely there's one thing i would always flag that if you're a solo founder is um and it sounds like a really wet thing to say but i think it's really really important is you need to have a really good network of almost your mental health is challenged so much anyway in life let alone when you're trying to build a business from scratch and cash is hard and the product's not been built quick enough and all these things you there needs to be a talking mechanism and at Ford we try to create um almost like a network for people just to chat about how shit it is sometimes but also how great it is sometimes we go these highs and these lows it's always great and then it's really bad again but unless you've got a network of people that get it around you it's really really hard so I think that's the biggest thing I would flag is just making sure you've got like that avenue if you haven't got a co-founder yeah 
hundred um, percent. We were talking about equity when it comes to the first few people in the team and how much equity you should be giving away. What about for an advisory board? Would you consider that from that like same pot that you're giving to employees or is that different? I think it's different. And I think it would be, a, it depends where you are and how much, how much you need them. So is it literally you need to tick a box to get your funding and then they go, in which case make it a really minimal percentage? Um, or is it that they're going to be really instrumental in terms of opening new networks? Have they got an amazing food and nutrition base in their network? And that's what you're doing. And therefore it's really paramount. So I think um, that's the other thing I would flag is a lot of advisors will do an advisory role for 12K per annum uh, or a quarterly 3K a quarter. So um, I've definitely that seems to be the number where people will come into pre seed and seed and do it for. So just be mindful that people that come in and ask for 60K per annum uh, may be a bit bigger than what you need. Or maybe it is that you need that because they're going to open a million pounds worth of revenue but I think you just need to put that ratio in place yeah Yvonne do you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question yeah hi hi Natalie yeah thanks so much um really good value um and really good advice uh, I've got a couple of questions so one question um is around maintaining a team that you've taken on as volunteers um so i um very quickly i'm a solo founder by the way my business is in their tech business and i've got a background in business and what we're doing we're building a product that reduces burnout in schools um and um one thing i quickly realized was it, there was so much to do as a solo founder so i thought about what skills i had and said how can i utilize them to get people who can help me in the business, I train them and then focus on other bits that need me. And so what I did, I got um, a few people from around the world actually, and this is gonna be one of our, one of the things I really would like to encourage in our company because there's a lot of people with a lot of great skills around the world that would you know, benefit so much from working with, with startup companies or from working with companies in developed countries. Um, now, my challenge is how do I keep them? Because they've done such a beautiful job. Uh, I'm just wondering how do I keep them while fundraising? Because we're fundraising, um, you know, starting December. Uh, they all work within marketing about one person who's um, helping me with operations. And then the second one is on tech. Um, the one thing that made it very difficult for us to have a continuous building journey is the tech side of the business. Um, you know, because bootstrapping means I don't always have the money now. And what I'm thinking is maybe rather than get a CTO, because CTO can come and go, um, maybe like get a, um, a company that can come in as an investment partnership on the tech side of things. And I'm just wondering how that works, you know, what kind of percentage to give away and things like that. We are, you know, we've done things like built the prototype, uh, got the UI UX um, for the MVP ready. So we a little bit advanced in, in, in terms of the build, not so much advanced in terms of traction. Um, hope that makes sense. Thanks. Yes, it does. Okay, so to go to your first one, so around retaining people. So I get, I completely get it. So you're waiting for the, you need to raise the funds and then retain them that way. Um, I think taking them through your fundraise, I don't know how you currently like liaise with them or the contact is, but I think you transparency around what you're doing in the fundraise, get them bought into that. It's a really big positive. Um, from a marketing perspective, uh, is there any sort of retention bonus you can put in place? So when we achieve this from a marketing perspective, financially you get X and therefore we can give them a small percentage of that. Is that an option? Because we're pre-revenue, I haven't got any retention of anything in the budget, but I could put it in the fundraising, I suppose. Yeah, that could be maybe a model that you could build in, in terms of your fundraising. So it's almost like the commission piece, but from a, but it's difficult to, I guess, work out your market reach now versus what it might be, but that could be a potential way of doing it. Um, the other piece, of course, would be if you're going through a raise is potentially equity for those people. So talking about that now with a view that when it comes in, that'd be great. Um, and the second thing on the um, the tech companies coming into play with you, so there's plenty of companies that will do that. Um, and actually, what that would help in terms of the partnership, the only thing, so there's two things I want to flag on this. Um, so I think there's quite a few agencies out there where they're basically like a tech hub. They'll come in and build it for you and then they'll go away again, um, which is great. They charge a lot of money, I think, in my humble opinion. And some of them will do like a split of equity and cash. But it's just working out what you're really getting from them. And then someone needs to manage it internally. So if you're not necessarily a tech background, it'd be how do you still manage it so you can still see and know that what they're building 
is right. And that's where I think trying to find some sort of tech advisor to help you evaluate what they're building would be really, really important. Um, otherwise, I think sometimes they can just build, but you don't know what you've paid 20 grand for. It's really difficult to work that out. So the idea was for the company to be the CTO. I've got really good tech advisor, by the way, and somebody who's run their own tech business for a lot, for a long, long time. But the, the biggest challenge is how how can for me it's it, it's also from I suppose from a real perspective, how can you call yourself a tech company when you really don't have a tech arm, if that makes sense? Is it, it when it's always starts stops? That's so how do you have that continuity? So I'm thinking why don't i mean I've, I've i've had maybe 10 interviews with different tech companies and i keep saying no because it's that i'm looking for somebody who's going to be with us for the long term not a cto not you because a cto can come and go you can fall out it's more a company that will offer that continuity and be our tech arm of the business because we are a tech business that that's kind of my yeah. thinking with it I think something like a partnership with companies, maybe like makers, people like that could be a really interesting avenue for you to explore. Like they, there's a few, um, so Makers Academy is really fascinating. They, they basically train people up and then you have a spin-off, but they create small spin-off groups. That could be a really good partnership for you to explore. Okay, uh, I'll check them out. Thank you. Awesome. I'm just going to ask um, if there's any more questions feel free to post and we'll try and go quick fire in the last five minutes. It's a question from Sam on the chat. What's a realistic founder's salary to put down in the finances? Um, these, these kinds of questions come up all the time actually, because there's an expectation that founders are paying themselves a minimum salary, but then obviously you need to be able to survive. Yeah, um, so the number we always see is 25K. Don't know where it comes from, don't know where it's there, but we always see founders for 25K as a salary. And we would afford, we would challenge you on, is that really the money that you need for you to be comfortable to be able to deliver what we need to deliver on this business? Um, the numbers that we've seen most often in the like post pre-seed would be 75K. And I take, I base that on what we've had. I, I preempted this question. So that's just based on like the founder portfolio within Forward and a few other uh, VC partners. Um, and that's what we're seeing majority so between that 50 75k i think if you're putting 25k we'd ask you around your personal circumstance and again that's not something to be offended by that's just understanding like is this going to be enough for you to live and you can still work on this project 24 7 or are you going to have to take a side hustle which means we get you for two days a week which means the goals for the next three years may not be achievable yes yeah, kind of i was going to say i'm keen to see what the other investors are recommended because i think some probably low ball it and some probably high ball it don't they yeah and then people the question that's just come in is similar to what we've heard from other investors, which is that you end up paying your first employees more than you're paying yourself, especially if you're hiring like a technical person or someone with loads of experience in ops, for example. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you would see as well? Yeah, all the time, all the time. And also this like this number of 50K always seems to be the number that people, so the founder slash first employee are always around there. Yeah. Um, and Mindy's just said that, the, their VC said 40K for the founder salary, I'm presuming you mean, Mindy. Yeah, I think it, it, it totally makes sense that it's, it's judged by your personal circumstance because you need to be able to afford to live and continue building your business. And if you if you can't actually drive the business forward, then it, it's not going to go on and succeed. Um, I've just got a last question based on something that you said earlier about your opinion on unlimited holiday, but benefits mm -hmm. generally... Um, because everybody uses unlimited holiday and all these kinds of things to make the package sound more competitive when you can't offer a high salary. So what is your opinion on unlimited holiday? And is there anything else from a benefits perspective that you think it's worth offering versus not really worth it to make a competitive package if you can't use salary? Yeah, so I think my first message here is just don't fluff the benefits. People see right through it. And actually, like everybody has unlimited holiday. First of all, unlimited holiday, just based on the research, people will take less holiday and therefore you've got higher burnout and higher sick days. So if that's the result, I think just having fixed days, people feel secure. They feel psychologically safe to take the holiday. It just is easier. I don't think that has to be a Thursday holiday. I don't think it has to be a Wednesday holiday. But I think just being transparent about what you can and can't take is important. Um, what I think is the best benefit you could possibly offer if your business allows it is complete and utter flexible working. And what I mean by that is if we're able to offer 
way more inclusive hours so people can work around the clock um, depending on where they are or what their circumstances are in life you'll get a much more diverse workforce um that's what people need at the moment and unfortunately it's what's being offered everywhere so people the bigger companies are able to offer complete flexibility and it means that if you're not able to do it yourself as a smaller company you end up missing out on that and people need it so I think that is the one benefit if you can actually do it is the biggest one that you can get over line now yeah so do you have any opinion on like I guess you kind of answered this question before, but having a physical office in terms of culture building for small early stage teams. My pers- the way I would do it if it was me um, is you have a remote first, but you meet whether it's once a month or two days a month or something like that. And therefore you do your big, like get everybody together on a social to make sure there's a personal engagement one of those days. And the second day is strategy for the next quarter and do it that way. I'm really, I feel quite strongly about that. Ironically, a forward, we're in the office two days a week. So it's not quite what I'm saying. But um, we don't have an international workforce or anything like that. But I definitely think pure flexibility, but with a bit of FaceTime is really important. I think if you can't do the FaceTime in person because you do hire people internationally, then having some sort of dedicated time where you find a window that works for every different time zone is really important. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for that whole um, hour of your time. I think we got through a lot of practical responses to questions. And a lot of people said they would love that um, commission structure that you mentioned for the sales teams. If you send it to me, I can just pass it on to everyone um, in the WhatsApp group. If people want to stay in contact with you, is it best via LinkedIn or email or something else? Um, either or. Um, I'll put my email in here now so everyone's got it and then things will go. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming along as well. We will see you all on Thursday at 2 p.m and that we'll keep in touch (laughs) thank you bye thanks so much natalie bye